Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure and privilege on behalf of Missions Department and COVID Command Training Team at Christian Medical College, Bello, to welcome you all today for today's Quality Circle, which is titled COVID-19 Second Wave Experiences from Rural India. Dr. Kenny David, Professor at Department of Spine Surgery, presently the Associate Director at Chittur Campus, and former Associate Director of Missions at CMC Vello will moderate the sessions. Over to you, sir. Uh, friends, uh, good morning and a very warm welcome from Vello. Uh, it's a privilege to have you with us this morning from across the country. And um, shall we begin with a word of prayer? Uh, our Father, we thank you for this time of coming together. We pray this would be a time of shared experiences and shared learning and mutual encouragement. So be with us now as we enter this time and be, let be a blessing to all who join and who listen. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So friends, many years ago, a friend, a senior colleague of mine helped me to understand that there is a difference between India and Bharat. Uh, today, we are going to listen to people from Bharat, the people who are at the very front line of, um, of healthcare. And today we have three um, actually four, three, uh, four uh, people who, are, who were connected in well, to Velo at some point in time in their training, but now are serving in North India and are really the embodiment of uh, the spirit that we want to see in our graduates and postgraduates, and really with, for any Christian who's involved in healthcare. So today we have Dr. Deepak and Ashita Singh from, um, from Chinchipada Christian Hospital in Maharashtra. Uh, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Anita Victor, who is now serving at the uh, Reynolds Memorial Hospital in Washim. We're going to hear from Dr. Dennis Martin and his wife, Cheryl, who are serving in Tilda. And uh, we're going to hear from Dr. Priya John, who's, uh, who's working with the CMAI, which is the umbrella organization for so many Christian hospitals and institutions around the country. So I'm looking forward to this time of uh, great learning and encouragement. And actually, um, we, we at Velour are going to be encouraged, I'm sure, by what these frontline workers are going to tell us. So without wasting further time, can I ask Deepak and Ashita? Deepak and Ashita, welcome to this uh, meeting. Lovely to see you both. Uh, time over to you to, to share what has been happening at Chinchipada. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kenji. And thank you, CMC Velo, for this privilege to present uh, what we have been able to do over the past year and especially over the past month. So again, it's our privilege and joy to be part of this uh, presentation. We praise God for the opportunity to be able to do this. Chishpara is a, located, a rural uh, hospital uh, located in the Northwest region of Maharashtra in the Western Khandesh region. And we have very poor and marginalized people with 66% of our population being tribal. Uh, finally, this man uh, wore this mask just about two days before the second wave hit us really hard. And uh, Chinchpara was established in uh, 1942. Uh, we were able to convert to an 84 bed COVID facility in a matter of days uh, as the demand rose for beds and oxygen. We were declared a DCHC in April 2020, and our COVID operations started in August. The second wave really hit us hard in the second or third week of March. Our blessings have been a team which pulls together, people multitasking beyond ours, support and input from our parent EHA, CMC Velo, CMC Ludhiana, CMAI, the many mission hospitals across India, and our network across India and across the globe. And we today are really grateful to each of the individuals, the institutions, and the uh, parent organizations who have helped us in so many ways. Our challenges have been a remote location, a population which was unable, unwilling to accept the diagnosis of COVID, a very poor response to education, and resistance to temp testing, even in the presence of symptoms, because we were told in the villages, there is no coronavirus, there is no COVID. 
our preparations and we thank God that we were able to prepare over the last year for what would come on us in the last one month. We started off with a triage. We also started off a flu clinic under a tree, but uh, we are able to now do it under a shed where people are evaluated for flu-like uh, symptoms and also tested at the same time. We were also able to make a new entranceway specifically for the COVID ward. And the sudden, when the sudden tsunami hit us in the middle of March, uh, we were able to garner every nook and corner in the hospital and create beds. So this ward, which usually holds 12 beds, held uh, 16 beds. The private rooms, which usually held one bed or two beds, we put in four so that we could uh, cater to all the people who were in need. The oxygen beds we started off with were 10 to start with, and then we were able to increase this to 47 over a period of two days. And we thank God for the networks and the people who were willing to do this in such a short notice. We thank God for all the people who contributed towards the concentrators, which we were able to up and were able to supply oxygen to about 20 people. So in total at present, we are able to manage oxygen for up to 67 patients at the same time. And we've had close to 50 to 55 patients who've been on oxygen on a single day. Our present challenges with a team which has been working really hard and doing three times the work that is expected. We've had several infections among staff despite the vaccination. We've also had a problem with the oxygen which has to be fetched from 125 kilometers away our vehicle has to go twice a day, sometimes once a day, to get the 20, 25 cylinders we need every day. Testing has been a big challenge and reports availability again has been a big challenge because there's only one lab in the district, but we thank God that we are at least able to test. So the availability of RT-PCR reports, if you see, there is so much pendency uh, all throughout. And uh, several times we've had patients who've been discharged or who've actually passed away after which their reports come. And uh, we've had a lot of deaths during the last month, especially because people have come in very late and we've had most of the deaths distributed among the 51 to 60 age group. Over to Ashita. Just want to thank CMC again for this opportunity. I'm sure I can speak for all of us across mission hospitals uh, in the country when I say that we've always felt valued and supported by you through your care for us and the people that we have uh, the privilege of serving in our land. So Deepak has already shared about the administrative aspects of the COVID response at Chinchpada. Uh, I have to say that it is any clinical team's dream to have an administrative leadership like ours. As I reflect on the speed with which the actual response on the ground was mobilized, it is mind boggling. From getting oxygen pipelines in place with uncanny foresight before the tsunami actually hit through round the clock work shifts, just the day before our COVID inpatient numbers went from 25 to 84, to mobilizing oxygen concentrators and adding jumbo cylinders to support over 60 patients with oxygen, to making quick decisions and delegating all the additional paperwork that comes with uh, COVID care in a pandemic, to communicating with the tens of offices that need reports, to ensuring enough supplies despite being remote from the city, to creating protocols and systems that can optimize the limited resources and manpower to care for a large number of patients. And finally, doing the precious work of caring for our patients in a holistic way. I think our small team really pulled it together to make it happen. And we can see God's hand of favor and providence through it all. Challenges on the clinical front were many. How do we optimize care while trying to keep the costs affordable? How do we manage such a large number of patients with such a small workforce, particularly when no family members are available for the care of sick patients? How do we prioritize among ox amidst ox oxygen shortages and just a few ventilators? How do we address the physical and emotional drain of a small team working nonstop to be delivering bad news, to be witnessing death and unspeakable suffering at many levels? Some practical steps that we took on the clinical side I just wanted to highlight. We made admission policies that kept up with the scenario that prioritized those who need hospital care, such as those with a pneumonia and oxygen saturations that were low or borderline. We ensured that on the wards, there were no unnecessary drugs or fluids on the order sheets so as to save time and energy for our limited staff nurses so that they could focus on crucial life-saving tasks. 
For example, we reduce the blood pressure monitoring to every 12 hours instead of every four hours, except in the ICU, unless it was otherwise specified, since hemodynamic instability is not a major issue in non-critical COVID. We are very grateful to CMC for their stellar stewardship in giving us uh, timely updates regarding evidence-based management guidelines that we could adapt to our settings so that we could function with confidence and with a clear conscience, not giving in to local pressures regarding unproven treatments that consume time and energy and expense. We brought in all available hands at the hospital that could be spared to help in the COVID ward, including our palliative care team, our office and registration staff who pitched in wholeheartedly with hands-on care through various designated tasks. These included taking food and water to patients, helping with communication between patients and families, especially for those who were not able to handle a phone and communicate with their families, making beds, helping with toileting, rechecking and reporting oxygen saturations after oxygen delivery flow rates were changed, checking and reporting abnormal uh, sugars, encouraging uh, uh, awake phone. The team also helped counsel and comfort the more burdened and anxious and fearful patients and families. Another thing that we did was a daily Google Sheet, which is updated bed by bed on rounds, which documents each patient's important details, including their demographic details, the day of admission, what they are admitted to, whether they are positive on any test or whether a test is awaited, which day of illness it is for them on that particular day, which day of hospital stay, how much or whether they are on dexamethasone, whether they require or have received remdesivir, what was their sugars for that day, the respiratory rate and the oxygen saturation on the, at the time of rounds, whether they are on or off oxygen, outcome if any for the day, and additional remarks. This Google Sheet became a real lifesaver for us. It was, it was very helpful for us to filter the various columns and find out how many total patients were on oxygen. What was our remdesivir requirement for the day? Who were the patients who needed more intensive monitoring and follow-up? Um, and who were the patients who needed tests and x-rays? And which patients were safely past their danger period of likely deterioration? It also serves as a master sheet that our data managers could use for sending reports to the government with easy access. More importantly, it helped us to have a reference document when we updated the families of the patients one by one after rounds outside the ward. With 80 plus inpatients, this process of updating uh, took about an hour and a half to two hours, but we recognize that it's a very crucial part of the care so that families' anxious questions and doubts could be adequately addressed. Coming to the lessons that we learned, we have huge reserves of capacity as teams of healthcare workers which we discovered to be able to re respond generously and efficiently in a crisis. This is a time of discovery and realizing much unexploited potential. There is a constant process of learning and refining our processes through continuous feedback and improvement. It is important to reflect continually as a team, to be open to suggestions and ideas from all members of the team and to seek guidance from each other as well as from others with more experience. Communication is a key element that significantly impacts the quality of the hospital experience, irrespective of the outcome for everyone involved, from the patient to their family and the healthcare team. When patients and families recognize that we genuinely care about their well-being, a deep sense of trust is engendered and a meaningful companionship results even in the reality of the pain. A word of appreciation, for example, to the cleaning staff when we noticed that bathrooms smell clean despite the doubling of users, or to the nurses for their loving service and caring for bed-bound patients, or to the data management team for their action behind this could energize tired bodies and lift up discouraged spirits. There will necessarily have to be a careful and thoughtful prioritization of competing values in a pandemic situation, particularly in resource-limited settings. It is important to recognize at times like these that medicine, which deals with human life, is more an art than a science from this perspective, more a vocation than a profession. We have been overwhelmed by the love and support we have received from friends, family, our networks at home and abroad, and even from strangers through friends across the world who have given so generously during this crisis. We want to make special mention of uh, CMC Velo, CMAI, and the Tata Trusts and Azim Premji Foundation, as well as Medic Assist International UK.
we are weak and frail and we can live with our seeming failures, giving them to God only when we have given him glory for our successes. He has come through for us time and again to provide what we need for each day as we continue to take steps of faith in the right direction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak and Ashita, for, for sharing that uh, from the heart and certainly from the front line. And I'm sure there are many things there in what you said that are lessons for um, many who are listening, me included. Um, may I just request all those who are, who are listening, if you have questions, to please put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll try to collate them and, um, and uh, address them in the question time that follows the sessions from all the from when all the speakers are, are through uh, and also please keep your uh, mics muted if possible uh, so that there is less interference in the audio um, our next speaker today is dr anita victor she uh, is a graduate of um, cmc velo but she's worked in so many different areas that she's probably the most uh, varied in her experiences uh, among all our speakers today, she's worked with the government, with the army, with the MSF, with World Vision, and now she's heading, and now she's heading CMC's initiative at the Reynolds Memorial Hospital in Washim in Maharashtra. So Dr. Anita, welcome to this um, group, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kenny and Dr. Judy, and uh, thank you CMC for this wonderful opportunity. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Yes, uh, today being Maharashtra Day and uh, also May Day, it's also the day when we had a very turbulent morning where we had our second death in the hospital. So um, we're just looking back and as Ashita and Deepak shared, this is truly saying that when we are weak, we are strong in Christ. So thank you Ashita and Deepak for affirming and um, helping us to realize that like I'm not alone. So greetings from Reynolds Memorial Hospital. This is in Vashim, Maharashtra. For those of us who are new to, new to India, this is uh, right bang below Bhopal. It's about six hours from Nagpur. We are not actually a rural center. We are, uh, it's a small district headquarter where Amazon delivers. And therefore, uh, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to be here. Um, I always, uh, you know, I'm a big uh, fan of Marvel comics and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And one of my favorite quotes is from the Iron Man. Um, he talks about, uh, in the last movie, and he talks about, it's not how much we have lost, it's about how much we have left. And I think we talk about the wave two, maybe there's a wave three, we don't know. But there has been a, a surge. And uh, I think for Reynolds Memorial Hospital, which is uh, a very unique partnership model led by the Church of Nazarene, CMC Velo, and EHA. Uh, we had this opportunity to leverage COVID work after three years of being closed for renovation when we started our DCHC in October 2020. So I'd like to take you through a little overview. And uh, I must say, it's been a very unique model. It's been exhausting at all levels. Uh, there's one in-house MO till about two, three weeks ago. That's MOA. And, uh, and uh, thankfully, then we have a new doctor, Dr. Banner, joining us. And we have a small team, and uh, it's abounding, abounding God's grace. This is basically our COVID ward, and we believe there is still hope. And um, every morning as we work there, there's always an opportunity to see a glorious sunrise, reminding that uh, God is still working on the throne, and um, he is there. So, so this is a journey of reflections and uh, the situation in Russia then and now. In, the, in October, we started off as a DC head C and uh, with 34 beds. And uh, we realized that we, were, we just didn't know what to expect because unlike the rest of the metros, uh, Russian was just not, we thought, serious enough for COVID. But then the way things have happened, it's been a roller coaster ride. And we have more than 26,000 cases reported on date, and we are actually overburdened here. The entire private sector in Russia has been called to action, and we are working very closely with the collector and his team here. 
So for Reynolds, we had resumed inpatient care after three years. So this meant that we would have to uh, really look at every aspect of clinical care, administrative uh, preparation, as well as looking at our own positioning for our image in this place. Uh, Reynolds was a renowned maternity hospital, and most people thought that it was still closed till we started the, the care here. So in the field, as of now, we started, it started in Pickles, and here we are. Uh, here we are in April, where we had more than 254 patients admitted in-house. And uh, we keep going because we have been asked to expand the number of beds, out of which uh, 25 beds are connected with central oxygen lines. We have an oxygen generator. And at that point, we had actually wanted it in October. But when it finally came to us in March, we just saw that it was the right timing for us before this surge hit us. Of course, there's a, one of the unique things about all the, many of our mission hospitals is there's the College of Nursing. And while most of the students had been sent away for the lockdown, we were able to engage with those who are left behind and uh, you know, starting to do very different things right from the beginning, it, engaging with small groups of patients. Because one thing that I consistently saw was that there was a very big fear factor. And uh, every day, we as a team dealt with fear in person. And this meant that we had to talk to people, we had to engage at a very different level than we had actually been used to. So the Nazarene Nurses Training College has been a blessing for us. And yes, I mean, it's not all about the numbers, but uh, I want to praise God that God has helped us with our limited resources, our limited capability, and what we have that we have still been able to minister unto patients and uh, work in our own specific way. The profile of the patient has also changed with time, geriatric population, moderate and severe pneumonias, and no place to refer them to. And therefore, it's been really, really um, helpful to listen, you know, to, to connect with CMC, to use the CMC handbook for reference, to connect with experts like Dr. O.C. Abraham, and, um, and also you know, to follow the state Maharashtra protocol for treatment, because there's an over-medicalization that happens in this town where there are more than 86, there are about 86 private practitioners and having their clinics who are also doing COVID work off the record. Uh, I wanted to show you this picture very specifically because this is a husband-wife couple. Um, and by the end of their stay here, it was uh, both of them had multiple comorbidities the husband had actually started to ask about, um, you know, the gospel. And uh, he was, in fact, he, he used to do a small devotion in the beginning of the day. And, and we used to play some music, instrumental music in the corridors. Um, and to me, I felt that um, as a family, they, they were really strengthened. And by the time they, did, they were discharged, uh, they attributed it to God. And I think that was, uh, you know, this is the real impact of what we want to see. So it's been uphill all the way, and uh, there are multiple challenges, as Ashita and Deepak also shared. Um, but I would not go into all the details, want of time. But as you can imagine, uh, we have uh, maybe Russian has not been on the radar. Uh, maybe we have not uh, been crying out more. But it's also been because the small team is multitasking, as other teams are, and we have cho chosen to put our hands to the plow and keep doing what we can. As of now, our center is at the risk of compromising quality over care because of the numbers. And uh, there's an overburdened government facility. We have a lot of stigma. And this has also resulted in the non-COVID care being affected. And importantly, the place that it is, there is a lot of uh, monopolization and the, the politics come into play, even in terms of even for the bed allocation. So. Uh, facing all this, and we realized that for the hospital, we are almost at uh, walking on a tight road uh, to balance operational costs, and then not really catering to the poorest of the poor, because this would mean that in order to sustain the hospital, we would have to, you know, charge the patients at some point. So this has been a dilemma for all of us in the team, and um, I think as the numbers begin to grow, we realize uh, we really need 
uh, go back to planning, go back to the drawing board and work out the map. What does it take to operate the hospital of this uh, for the pandemic in the days to come? So I'd like to, before we talking about lessons learned and uh, challenges and experiences, I thought it's also important. I'm representing the team here and uh, just wanted to say um, about some of her sisters. So she's a COVID survivor and she and her son were both infected with severe pneumonia last year. And then, you know, this is her quote and really thank you to God for the way she has been able to come back to the ward. She talks about simpler processes, a lot of admin hassles, and of course, resources being constrained. We have few monitors, few less PPE. It was also thanks CM CMAI and CMC for giving us uh, disposable gowns and, and other materials like that. Uh, but yeah, we believe that we survived COVID last year and now we can do it again. Our nurse interns, some of them are working with us and this really eases the burden. Uh, there's no technically six hours, eight hours shift because it doesn't matter. We are just there almost 18 to 20 hours a day. And um, yeah, and uh, Owen is symptomatic. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I'm, I'm hoping and praying that he will recover quickly. And uh, we realize the care of the staff and especially the nursing staff and the interns is a priority uh, with all of the resource constraints financially, who's going to pay for them? You know, who's going to take care of their uh, medical expenses? Um, I, I'm sorry to inform you that as of today, two of our admin staff are also COVID positive. So, you know, it's it's already uh, it's a strain on the existing system. But the beauty of this is that they are working. Uh, they are in the hospital, they are in the admitted, but they're also working from their, uh, in their respective beds. Um, this is our multi-purpose health worker, Mrs. Pushpa. So she has her own challenges, but she comes to work with a smile. It's about eight to 10 hours of a shift that she does uh, with uh, multiple bathroom cleanings, bed making, serving food, and all that it takes to be part of the team that's in the ward. So yes, we have an old building, it's high maintenance. There is a lot of PPE fatigue and uh, the HR needs continue to be high. This is Lalita Jadav is one of, once again one of our very senior colleagues in the organization and how she has reinvented herself from being uh, primarily uh, taking care of antenatal mothers to responding to what I call ICU care minus the, the you know the the frills and the ambience of an ICU is uh, it's been amazing how in spite of her own physical disability she continues to work with us. And what we're seeing as a team is there are a lot of multiple psychosocial effects, not just on the patients, but on the staff, because it's been now the seven, seven and a half months running into the COVID ward. And uh, yes, and these effects are real. All this is a team effort. Uh, we have Robin, who's an admin superintendent, Mrs. Ruth and Rajla. And we continue to do this uh, tightrope walking balancing care, making sure the poorest patients are served, and also ensuring that we give God all the glory. This is one of my favorite pictures. I use it in many of my presentations. And um, as I talk about this, talk about this uh, today, it's about overcoming challenges all the way. And we realize this, you know, we don't know what's ahead. But we know that when faith and fear both demand that we believe in something that we cannot see. So it's up to us what we choose to see today. And as a team, I believe that we choose faith. There have been a lot of negative reports. Even the death this morning has been deeply unsettling. But we know that we need to trust God and move along. We all come daily. We have our little parties. We wake up and go back to the uh, to to work again. Um, and, and through it all, I think, uh, respected listeners, one of the most important lessons that I believe we are learning is it's a different kind of war for all the Star Wars fans out there. It is a different kind of war. And it is a spiritual war that we're dealing with right here in Bashir, a place of drought, a place of spiritual poverty. And the battle plan is that it's not ours, but it's not us to fight, but we're not fighting against the physical symptoms of COVID, but it is much deeper. 
and as a team we choose to put our hope in the lord he is our help and our shield some major lessons learned have been that the admin team has to work in cohesion with the clinical team seamlessly uh, while though we are at small in numbers patients respond well when we spend time with them interacting a little bit more than you know uh, we need to so we have tried to have some so social distancing with the patients but we do have music we do talk to patients we some of us have removed layers of ppe just so that they can connect and see our faces and uh, you know through the face shield and stuff like that and of course the clinical team we constantly need to be uh, you know motivated we need to keep studying and updates because we have an in-house doctor who does an evening uh, i mean a visiting consultant i'm sorry who comes and visits comes about 10 15 minutes a day so we have to rely on each other to make sure we're doing the right things for the patient in terms of medical protocols so overall it's been uh, lessons learned is the patient is at the center of what we do and uh, it's not just about renovating a hospital or reviving a mission hospital but it's about why we are there and the heart of it all uh, is if we are here today and i'm making a very very unique covid response model uh, it is only the grace of god uh, thank you very much i'm open to questions right now thank you uh, dr anita for um, for sharing that straight uh, i i i think that that slide about a soldier never being off duty is really uh, powerful and i think all of us are always um on call always available that's what we are meant to be um we are seeing a lot of questions in the chat box and we may not be able to address all of them but i can assure you that we'll be able to redirect them to the people uh, who are to whom this is addressed and i'm sure we'll find a way to get the answers back to you so please keep the questions coming uh, and now we'll go to dr to chatisgarh to tilda where uh, dennis and sherel david are um, are uh, frontline heroes so dennis and sherel welcome over to you thank you dr kelly and uh, <clears throat> it's wonderful because uh, we started our secondary hospital journey with dr kenny he was our <laughs> he was the person who accompanied us to manali first when we went to manali so we <laughs> it's a privilege to be presenting to you in front of you you are moderating and uh, um though uh, this presentation has been uh, made by sherel she said that you have to present i will not be speaking and uh, much of what we have done more than half or actually half at least 50 50% or more than that she has been uh, the key person in that but i will be presenting on behalf of her so uh, thank you for thank you cnc for uh, uh, allowing us to be able to do this and uh, i think we are the Uh, yeah, <laughs> we are the junior most among all the people who have spoken, and they have they have done tremendous amount of work, remarkable amount of work. And what we are doing probably doesn't uh, what we are doing in our situation probably doesn't match to what they have been able to do. But uh, we are doing what we can uh, from the experiences that we have. So, uh, uh, greetings to you all from Evangelical Mission Hospital. A little bit about us. Uh, Uh, the first american missionary who reached here in 1896 they saw that satnamis were the community that really needed care because there was nothing in this part of the central india a lot of activity was being uh, channeled to madhya pradesh but chatisgarh part was being left out so uh, they went back and they thought that a hospital is a good way to evangelize to people so uh, in 1929 this hospital was established and it said it has worked since then and this hospital also started the first nursing school in central india so uh, sort of we came to tilda 2 years ago and uh, we sort of revisited our vision and mission statements uh, during the previous years over time probably the vision became a little more blurred so we uh, revisited it and basically we are working to transform communities in the spirit of christ so uh, uh we were non corona and uh, during the last year most of the year uh, i just want to tell you about our place we are in the tilda subdivision we are semi urban 
it's a small town with a population of about three lakhs around including all the villages but most of our uh, population comes from the 160 villages that are around us and our hospital is a uh, though we call it a 100 bed hospital because of the nursing school attached but it's it's a 50 bedded hospital with uh, about uh, 40 operational beds in a general setting with about 70 percent of occupancy and uh, we see about 75 patients in our opd and uh, we do orthopedics, general surgery, and obstetrics. Um, we have started a few community health projects, and uh, we also run a nursing school. So uh, during the first wave, we had uh, started our preparations. We had done some staff training. Uh, we, in the January 2020, we started trying to teach our staff that we probably will have to uh, deal with this COVID. So we started preparing them and we started accumulating PPEs at that point of time because that was a big thing. And uh, uh, we also did before, this is uh, pre-COVID time, the pictures that are there were before the COVID had hit India. So we had started community orientation about uh, hand washing and distancing. and uh, But the 2020 wave actually did not hit us. Uh, we had very few patients uh, who were probable COVID, which we were able to refer, and we were never called to, or we were never uh, allowed to start treating COVID in the first wave. So uh, we had started a fever clinic then, and we were able to treat a few uh, people in the fever clinic, but that did not hit us. The first wave did not hit us at all. So uh, during this wave also, we were not really uh, one thinking that the COVID will hit us. So uh, this is our hospital only. The government has taken our part of our hospital as a vaccination center for them. And the vaccination started in January. And by early February, almost 90% of our staff were vaccinated. And by uh, first, uh, were vaccinated for the disease. Um, we never thought that this uh, COVID will hit us as bad as it did. But uh, by the end of March, uh, the OPD uh, fever trends changed. So we had to start a fever clinic again. And probably there was a road safety week cr cricket tournament that happened here in Chhattisgarh, after which Sachin Tendulkar and uh, Irfan Patan had gotten COVID positive. I think that was the trigger incident where at least 40,000 people were in the stadium. And that sort of triggered our wave of COVID that uh, that came to Chhattisgarh, that ex escalated. So in the first week of uh, April, we had a meeting with our doctors, nurses and staff because we were seeing a lot of fever clinics. We took everybody on board uh, and we talked about how we can do. But the, pro uh, the disease, the number of cases progressed very fast. Uh, uh, our OPD started becoming from 75 to 140 uh, with most of them being fever cases. And we went into a strict lockdown on the 9th of April itself. Uh, the, it, it went for a district lockdown, complete lockdown on the 9th of April. And uh, we had to become a COVID center because the number of cases was so much. We started our work on 13th. We got the permission from government on 15th. So we had a planning meeting on 13th when we were planning, uh, uh, when we were planning to become a COVID center. We called everybody and uh, we told them that uh, this is the situation right now and we can't turn away from this situation. So uh, are, is everybody ready? And there was a lot of apprehension between the nurses and even our doctors, uh, the junior doctors and a um, lot of hesitation as to what will happen and what will happen. Uh, but uh, we praise God and we thank God that our staff rallied behind us along with us and they also rose up to the challenge. So we started our uh, admitting patients on the 13th of uh, April. And uh, we allocated every, uh, uh, we allocated different uh, functions to different staff and they all managed. The doctors did the med man medical management and protocols. The nursing superintendent started uh, about the duty shift rosters and all. And administrators started uh, trying to build our uh, capacity to uh, fight this disease. This is uh, 
our OPD on the left, that's the OPD that we had started now. We, the OPD is inside, but uh, the patients, we make them wait outside in the line fever clinic. And one by one, the patient come in as they are called. And this is one of our wards with oxygen cylinders inside. So uh, this is how we started. We started on the 15th of April with uh, five big cylinders and 10 small cylinders and two oxygen concentrators with uh, our oxygen refilling happening 80 kilometers away. And we were going twice a week for refilling. And uh, we started a fever clinic with 40 patients in the beginning. And uh, we started initially with 20 COVID beds with 10 oxygenated and 10 oxy non-oxygenated bed and one ward which we used for our COVID patient. The pharmacy used to run during working hours eight to four and then our pharmacy used to close even the billing. And uh, we were getting about 10 to 12 calls a day. But now at this current point of time, uh, we praise God for all that support that has come to us for all the channels that he's opened us. Now we have about 20 to 25 jump, big cylinders, 30 small cylinders, and 35 C type cylinders with five concentrators. We, are, we have our oxygen refilling is now at uh, 20 kilometers to us, but still we are sending our vehicle three times a day to fill our cylinders. We have a fever clinic of about 125 now, and uh, we've become a 40 bed functional uh, COVID center with all the beds, almost all the beds we are giving oxygen on now. And uh, we have converted uh, from one ward to three ward for COVID. And uh, our pharmacy now is running around the clock. The like same billing is running around the clock. We had we have to take had to take additional contract staff for that. Now our uh, central oxygen line supply line is being put and established. Uh, as we speak right now, two wards have been done, and uh, we are still getting 200 to 250 calls a day for admissions and various administrative purposes. So this is our statistics. I know it, it may be shocking. We have admitted 210 patients, but we had 65 deaths out of them. We had 105 discharges. And we have seen in the past 15 days, 1,500 patients, more than 1,500 patients in the fever clinic. So uh, what have we learned? Basically to prioritize the staff. That, that is what we have learned. We have to prioritize our staff. We have to continuously give encouragement and appreciation to our staff. They need to feel safe that, uh, we, that they, are, they, are, they, are, they have enough protection and they have enough backing in case they feel uh, they, fail, they fall sick also. And uh, we had to remove all other work from them. Non-urgent work we had to decrease and we have to reallocate them towards the areas that are needed. And definitely they need a lot of counseling, everyday encouragement to face these challenges that they are seeing, especially because we are seeing a lot of deaths here. Reserve staff, uh, we have uh, nursing school tutors, we have not recruited them as of yet, but we know that we will need to in future because uh, our staff who are already working, some of them are turning positive. Uh, nursing students, the Chhattisgarh government sent a, uh, this thing, advisory that all the final year uh, GNM students will be taken for work. So we have taken them, but we are using them in non-COVID areas. We are using them in other areas where they are not uh, being exposed to COVID directly. We are using them as nursing apprentices. All hands on deck. Yeah, everybody needs to do. Everybody needs to multitask. We, uh, because our resource limitation, everybody has to pitch in with whatever they can do. Our physiotherapist and dentists are doing our fever, fever clinic so that our doctors, uh, our MBBS doctors can work in the wards. Uh, this is a one a picture of a corridor of a uh, ward. Two wards are there, and the first one, the left side picture, and uh, our drivers are pitching in with the patients and the oxygen cylinder uh, taking. And the right side is our uh, emergency, where you can see most of our COVID patients who need admissions are sent there, and uh, there only they are assessed, and then from there they are admitted in the ward. What are we learning? We are learning that we are not the healers. Uh, we do not know uh, uh, who will survive, who will not survive. We give the same treatment. Some people get better, some people do not get better. So we have learned 
<clears throat> more during this time that we are not the healers, the healing come from above. We are just care providers. The patients are and relatives are really desperate. They are in desperate situation because uh, they do not have places to go. Uh, how much ever we try, we cannot admit everybody. Um, we are trying to expand our oxygen carrying capacity, but still we, are, we have to turn away some people. And our mortality is high because uh, people do not have uh, places where they can take the people who really require uh, critical care. So uh, we can see the desperation and the need for people to know God, uh, to know Jesus in this time. Uh, communication is the key. And we have seen that people do not come and beat us if the patient dies because we are communicating with them every day. And uh, <clears throat> this is one thing that we have learned that if you can't provide uh, care to them, if you can't provide them uh, what is necessary, just give them dignified deaths. Let them have comfort at the end of their life. We have... Uh, seen that because of all the COVID around, the obstetric patients are uh, really getting neglected. So we have kept a separate obstetric area where uh, our numbers in obstetric care has also increased. Uh, we have seen how to fundraise and how to put your hands up and ask for help when, when it is needed. And we have seen people rise to occasion at this point of time, really providing their uh, support beyond what we had expected. And uh, we've also learned how to deal with officials and how to deal with the government uh, machinery, actually, because they are also under tremendous pressure. And they are all providing, they understand, they all provide a lot of uh, support. Uh, we have lost two of our staff uh, during this 15 days itself. Uh, one was 56 year old, one, both, uh, one, another one was 43 year old. Uh, but the problem was even after uh, telling all of them, even after asking all of them, they, these two people were not vaccinated. We have seen the vaccinated people, they come out of the disease with mild symptoms. The people who are not vaccinated are going into severe disease. Um, we, uh, our shortcoming is that we are not able to do more uh, than what we, what we are currently doing. And uh, yeah. <laughs> An orthopedician and three junior doctors are running this facility. So <laughs> we are in uh, capacity, we are less. So we, uh, we regret that we do not have a specialist at this point of time. And <clears throat> during this time, we have seen the best of humanity as in people coming together, working uh, the best that they can give to the uh, support to the patients. But we have seen the worst also. Our so oxygen difference. cylinders, initially we were trying to get the cylinder that you get in 14,000, we were not even getting for 30,000. So that is the problem. And this has exposed how we are as humans. Uh, what we can do together, thank you, for, thank you to CMC COVID lectures because all our protocols were based on that. The timely help and the timely updates that CMC gave we are really helpful. I will especially mention Chinchpara because they were ahead of us in this game and we were able to take and adapt a lot of their strategies in our hospital. They, we were in contact with them. Dr. Deepak Ashita might not know because, Alice. because Alice was uh, Alice and Cheryl are friends, so they were uh, coordinating together. Uh, we have seen that people have really uh, pooled in for resources. I just reached out to my batchmates, school, school friends, and they have been instrumental in raising a lot of money for us and support. We want to thank all of them. We also thank CMI at the right point, at, at the right junctures. Like last year, they provided us PPEs. This year, they helped us to uh, send our uh, fundraising request to the right channel partners, and they have uh, mobilized a lot of fund for us. So we want to thank them also. And we want to thank all for all the support and uh, we also say that we also support and encouragement coming our way. So I want to finish by saying, uh, by quoting 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4, uh, that father of compassion, our father uh, of Lord Jesus is the giver of all compassions and he comforts us and th so through that we can comfort everybody.
This is the staff picture. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dennis and Sharil. Thank you so much. That was a, that was a very powerful and moving um, talk, and we really appreciate that. Um, and at least you have proven, Dennis, that an orthopedic surgeon can do something in this situation. So thank you for that, at least. Yeah. We really appreciate that. That's a message. That's a loud message. God bless you all. So now, uh, for our last talk today, uh, we're going to go to Dr. Priya John. Dr. Priya is the General Secretary of CMAI in Delhi. And I think from her, we are going to see an organizational response to what can be our response as a group of hospitals, as uh, as as representatives of Christian healthcare in this country, what should be our, our, our perspective and our response? Dr. Priya, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kenny. Thank you to the COVID uh, unit, as well as to the missions department for giving us as CMEI this incredible privilege of just sharing a little bit of how we can contribute to the response of COVID through our mission hospitals here in our country. Yes, CMAI is a 116 year old organization. Yes, we have a membership of over 273 mission hospitals and over 9,000 individual members, all healthcare professionals as our membership. Having said that, and as I share this morning, I'm very conscious that I speak on behalf of each of my staff, both, both at the Delhi Secretariat, the, head, the headquarters, the Bangalore branch office, and all our field staff. It is a bit overwhelming because we are in a very strange situation as far as our country and what we're seeing in terms of suffering. It is our privilege as CMEI to be a part of the journey with our mission hospitals who are the frontline workers, who are the ones who are engaged, the ones who are stretched, the ones who are tired, the ones who are committed, and the ones who will not give up. Yes, every mission hospital started with the commitment of one person, a calling and that calling is very real to each one of our presenters this morning and to each one of the others who are engaged in daily 24 hour service for the community that they are called to serve. Now, just to bring in, I am very conscious of the time and I will not take too much time because the story that you heard from the three presenters is the real deal. We are only the back end. But as the back end, I would just like to say what we do to, to make that little bit of difference. Let me paint you a quick picture. Just think of a time that you were working in a mission hospital or corporate hospital or any place of work. Just take a, a moment when you have finished a hard day's work, either you are a tutor, you're a doctor, you may be a nurse, you might be in the lab, you might be in the OT, you might be in the canteen. Whoever you are, or you might be guarding the gate. Take a moment to just think, when you sit down and you're tired and you're weary, and you just want to have that cup of tea or coffee, or you just want to put your head down, or you just want to stretch. What is it that you really desire to have? What is it that will make your life easier so that you can have that five minute break, that you can have that five minute of refreshment, that five minute of just re reinvigoration? What is it that you need? Whatever comes to your mind, I hope somewhere CMAI is answering that question. One, how can CMAI make your life easier so that you can put your feet up for five minutes? Please be assured that we, as staff of CMAI, 
are keeping you daily in our prayers. We are also united with other church organizations as well as other Christian like-minded organizations in supporting each one of you in prayer. Second, we would like to ensure that each of your staff in your hospital have their capacity built. So we will make sure that as a leader, if you want to take a break, you are assured that your juniors will step up and do what is required. So we will ensure that we will build capacity of all your team members so that there is holistic care provided even when you just need to put your feet up. We will ensure that we help you in putting, putting protocols in place, whether it is just sending you things from CMC Velour and the other technical experts, we will do that. We will ensure that we build little maybe technology into your daily work so that your rounds instead of two hours becomes maybe half an hour. We will try to make your life easier. How will we help you with HR? Now that is a place where we have failed miserably. Dr. Dennis talked about just being a few doctors. Can I bring more doctors? Difficult. But we will ensure that we will try to at least put the word out there through our various publications to make sure somebody volunteers to come. We will work with the EMFI and other um, organizations who nurture students and ensure that they instill, we instill that little mission mindedness in them. How will we help with your financial needs? Yes, you have heard from our presenters that CMA was able to mobilize some PPE. We were able to mobilize some funds, but yes, that is a drop in the ocean. We will try our best to first, how will we you know, bring down that cost burden that you have? We will ensure that we get a little bit of equipment whenever we can to send it across to you. We will ensure that suppose you want your staff to be trained and you don't have the money for that training. We will take away that burden of cost from you and sponsor them for a training. If you need a consultancy to get some protocols in place, some systems in place, we will take that burden of paying that consultancy fees. So in that way, that HR equipping, equipping will be done. As far as fundraising goes to bring in money, we are trying our best through all platforms to amplify each one of you so that they see you and they come directly to you and help wherever you need the help. Now, looking at the, the church, you know, that is our mandate to work with the church. How will we do that? This is the only time we will work with the community, ensure that the community really benefits from the Christian presence in our country. And that we will do through the church. And we are very privileged to work with the NCCI and bring in their whole strengths to ensure that we have a wide scale up. Yes, there are limitations, but we will not stop trying. Community, looking at the networking, you know, we will look at ensuring that we work with the, the Catholic sector, as well as all the sectors involved in healthcare through the Christian Coalition of Health or the CCH and ensure that we engage with the government to bring your voice of concern to them at the national as well as at the local level. Many times we are able to do it, but sometimes it is, there is a block. But the government, I'm sure with God's grace and you know, his direction will change their minds and bring in something that will, it will help our mission hospitals so that they can continue providing care to the poor and the vulnerable because that is our mandate. And that is the mission of Christ, the poor and vulnerable. Once they are our bottom line for any decision-making, I'm sure everything will work out in just the right way. There are so many other areas that we can be of use, but I would just, this is the, the, the key thing I would like to present. So please be assured that we are here as CMAI to make your life easier. And in the COVID response, we have been able to engage with policy. We have been able to fundraise. We have been able to train. We have been able to just, just journey with our hospitals and each one of the 
uh, individuals engaged in wherever pla whichever place they are in in any in in, a, in the smallest way possible and we may not have big solutions for each of the concerns but more than just having a whiteboard with all the schedules and meetings we would like as cmi to be the voice of hope to be the presence of christ to journey with each one of our members and to bring that little bit of healing as you know the be the channels of that healing which our lord brings and may all of us be available for that thank you very much for this opportunity and i will hand over back to uh, cmc velo team thank you dr priya thank you the work of cmi is much appreciated uh, friends we we are coming to the end of our time today this has been actually overwhelming in some ways but deeply inspiring and encouraging motivating in many other ways and i'm i'm sure all of us are going to go away from this time having learned lessons that we want to implement in our own lives and the lives of our organizations and so um, this has been such a useful time i think for all of us uh, but let me suggest that this is not about so much about the stories of these three hospitals and the story of cmai and what they are doing the question actually comes back to us to you and to me what is each one of our own individual response to this and that's the question i hope we can go away with is there something we can do in our own little sphere of influence to contribute to this effort and i'm sure we are all doing that or can we um, do something to make the life of someone on the front line a little bit easier and i hope that is a question that will burn in our hearts as we go away from here because each of us is is playing a part in this battle and um, if we are not fighting we are supporting uh, and that should uh, that should be the guiding principle and philosophy for each one of us as we engage as we face the times the weeks and the months ahead so thank you all for joining uh, we really don't have time for questions today i apologize but we have take we have made a note of all the questions that have come in the chat box and what we are going to do is we are going to collate them and uh, we are going to sift through them and we'll make sure that each question gets a reply we'll channel them to the right uh, people and we'll get uh, we'll get uh, we'll get your answers to you and again just to let you know that any questions uh, can be directed to the missions office and we'll make sure that every question gets a response because each question is coming from a real real life situation we we believe that so with those comments i'll hand over to dr julie to uh, make some uh, closing remarks and then we'll end this time thank you all for joining thank you friends thank you all for joining i'd like to announce that the next session is scheduled to be held on may 7th friday between 4 to 5 pm please note the time and the change in the day uh, this is titled pragmatic facility planning operations and innovations from rural india i would like to especially thank the administration of cmc and the covid command center without whose help and direction this would not have been possible and a very special thanks to all our awe inspiring and courageous speakers i would like to encourage you all from the scripture as you tirelessly combat this crisis the verses from deuteronomy 31:8 the lord himself goes before you he will be with you he will never leave you nor forsake you do not be afraid do not be discouraged thank you everyone god bless and be safe